If you ask a younger O-Gage modeler if he knows who Frank Ellison was, the response might be, Frank who? But ask that same question of someone who's been in the hobby a while, and you'll get an immediate response. Frank Ellison? Oh yeah. Delta Lines. Through hundreds of magazine articles and the construction of his famous railroad, Delta Lines, Frank Ellison is considered by many to be the father of modern O-Gage railroading. And for those lucky enough to have operated on the real Delta Lines, walking into Frank Miller's basement is an instant case of deja vu because Frank has created a virtual duplicate of Delta Lines. But when Frank started construction of his railroad, he had never heard of Frank Ellison. I didn't know who Frank Ellison was at the time, but I thought that uh, the layout would fit in my basement. Didn't realize at the time what I was copying or duplicating until friends came over from other model railroaders and discovered what I had and the word was out. Once I found out who Frank Ellison was or realized who Frank Ellison was, then, then it became a, a really a pleasure to try to duplicate what uh, a man that was so uh, important and, and uh, the backbone of model railroading had been. And uh, it was a real pleasure just to try to duplicate his, his model in his railroad. Over the years, I have double-tracked areas that he had single track in. I've added sidings where he didn't have them. I put uh, a branch line in. I put uh, reverse loops in to turn trains rather than break them down. And various other little things, but the basic track plan remains Frank Ellison's. Even with those changes in the track plan, the overall effect is there. Frank Miller's towns, like Ellison's, are named after members of his family, but most of the structures within those towns are different from those on Delta Lines. But they were scratch-built in much the same manner. Well, the buildings are, are built mostly of uh, cardstock, mostly uh, Strathmore board and uh, wood. Various uh, methods of using the cardstock and the various, some plastic used on them, various places. Shingles are made from paper. Uh, instead of just simulated uh, pictures or something, they're actual shingles. Uh, some of the buildings are made all of wood. Uh, there's all kinds of methods of using the various products that are available to make these structures. And they're generally copied from blueprints found in magazines, uh, pictures found in magazines, or imagination. The building may be built to fit a particular location. Uh, without any regards to uh, whether it's a prototype or whether it's uh, feasible or not to do it that way. It was my own imagination that made me do it. There are about uh, five buildings, I believe, on the railroad that are copies and duplicates of Frank Ellison's building, uh, copied from prints in various magazines. Those scratch-built buildings include this one, the Oblong Box Company, made famous for its unique design of putting a car inside the buildings. Delta Lines was a significant model railroad because it was the first one to show how model railroading could be more than just trains running in a circle. Frank believed that a model railroad could actually be run like a real railroad, and he designed his railroad with operation in mind. William Harry was a regular operator on Delta Lines in the 40s and 50s. Delta Lines was... Uh was a two-division railroad separated by Colbert Yard. That was a division yard. The Fillmore Division was a single-track line with passing sidings, and the Chappelle Division was a double-track line for the most part. I was a Fillmore engineer, and uh, that was my regular job. Sometimes I would uh, uh, do other things, but uh, most of the time I, ran the, I was an engineer on the Fillmore Division. Frank Miller's Cascade Valley Railroad needs several people to operate the railroad, including a dispatcher who sits at this console. He assigns all the power blocks and handles the main line switches. The Cascade Valley operates almost exactly the same as Delta Lines did. Typical operating night, it takes about uh, eight people to run the railroad. It starts out with uh, the uh, commuter services running back and forth and then the mine trains operating and delivering coal or picking up coal. Uh, then it's your early morning uh, mail train, milk train, 
passenger trains run throughout constantly on the entire operating session. Your through freights will run off and on, and the way freights go in and out on a regular timetable schedule. Both railroads are operated like the real thing, which can be serious business. But also on both roads, there were a few moments for laughter. So Frank brings the train out, and I, was, I, I gave him the signal that my train was coming in. And right on Door Canyon Bridge, they were, weren't going very fast by this time because one was leaving the station and one was coming in. But they happened to meet on that crossover on this Door Canyon Bridge. They happened to be clunk, just like that. <laughs> they turned around. Everybody heard the clunk, and everybody stood up, and Frank's face turned a bright red. Here were the two trains head on collision right there, and then the approach to Fillmore Yard. <laughs> and so uh, Frank turned beet red. And he said, okay, fellas, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. <laughs> no argument. And we had a great time trying to uh, say, well, Frank, this is a pretty serious situation. The two, uh, two Delta Limiteds head-on collision. So we, we demoted him down to the bottom of the seniority list, and he never got back up for about another three weeks. <laughs> So he was relegated to yard duty and everything else, every kind of a job that nobody else wanted for about three weeks. Well, another thing that used to bother Frank in, in more ways than one was the fact that when you left the station, with a, especially with a freight train, you had to be sure that when you wound up in Colbert Yard that you had as many cars on that train as you did when you come in. Because once in a while, in a tunnel or something, a coupler may come loose and left a caboose or something in the tunnel. And uh, many times uh, a train would arrive and Frank would say, where's the caboose on that freight train? And oh my God, it's somewhere on the railroad someplace. And sure enough, another train would come along with a caboose on the front end <laughs> where it was left from a previous train. And they used to get a lot of demerits for that. When the trains run on the Cascade Valley, they move through some beautifully scenic territory. Frank has an unusual but effective method of making that scenery. The scenery is uh, built on forms cut out with a saber saw or a band saw with wire screen or window screen placed over it and a mixture of cement, sawdust and lime is applied over that. The sawdust acting as a bonding agent and uh, releases the setting time of it so that you can work with it much longer. You can come down 24 hours later and still carve detail into it if you care to because the sawdust releases the moisture slow. It's mostly cement, a little lime in it to make it sticky and the sawdust mixed to a consistency of about uh, oh, a thin putty and it's applied on the scenery, the screen with a, with a table knife, spatulas, whatever I happen to think works the best. Uh, rocks are carved into it uh, after it sets a while and it takes, it takes about 24 hours for it to set up hard enough and I've come down after plastering scenery uh, one night, I've come down the next day and still carved details into it. And of course uh, one word is to uh, poke the holes for the trees right away with nails. I have nails sticking up all over where the trees possibly will be. Not that I use them all, but it's, uh, that's the way it's done. The scenery sets the stage for the trains on the Cascade Valley. This was also the way Frank Ellison viewed his miniature world. The trains are the characters, the uh, buildings and the uh, bridges and the, uh, are the sets. And the, the trains themselves are the performers. And he thought of it that way. Frank was also a master at painting things to create illusions of reality. There was one bridge uh, uh, that was a stone bridge, an arch bridge, which has been pictured in some of the magazines. And so people would come up to Frank and say, boy, that's a, that's a beautiful stone bridge. You I must have taken hours for you to, make, to put all those stones together on that bridge. He says, go up and touch it. And so they'd go up and touch it. It was a flat piece of cardboard that he'd painted. And it looked exactly like it was a stone bridge. One night, the local uh, television station, a radio station, radio and television at that time, WDSU in New Orleans, uh, came out and did a, um, a show, filmed a show on 
Delta lines. And at that time, I took, uh, uh, took advantage of all their lights and so forth that they used to, uh, to do their show with, and uh, uh, I shot some color slides myself that same night. Everybody remarked about how realistic this was, and some people didn't believe it was a model railroad. These images, shot by William Harry, are the only known color images of Delta lines that exist. They were taken at a time before all the scenery on the railroad was completed, but these priceless images give us a glimpse of the past, a glimpse of the history of O-scale model railroading. I must say that I've seen railroads all over the country and in some in Europe too, but I never saw any railroad that looked as realistic as what Frank had down there. And I think the reason for it was that it was all logical. He didn't build anything unless it was for a purpose. All of these industries, all of this stuff were, one led to another. It was logical that if you put a packing place up, there would be an ice company next door or something like this. The, the whole thing had homogeneity to it. Well, Frank Ellison was a, was a wizard at, at his techniques and his uh, overall conception of what a model railroader should be, or a model railroad should be. He was and probably remains the master of model railroading uh, as far as the general operation of a railroad and the designing of a railroad and what it should do as a model. Well, I think certainly he's one of the most important of the pioneers in this hobby. I'm always uh, referring to articles to this day of how Frank did it because I think it's so logical what he did and the results are very satisfying if you follow pretty much what he did and most of the way I build things is, is I try to emulate how he did it. Frank Miller's Cascade Valley Railroad is loaded with scenes reminiscent of Delta Lines. Delta Lines has since been dismantled and split up and various parts have gone to different uh, people. I understand the railroad was destroyed uh, in some way uh, in transportation uh, and I feel that I, in duplicating his railroad I have the uh, something that 
people that we're interested in the Delta Lines can come here and see this and uh, possibly get a, a peek into the past. Yes, Frank Ellison was a wizard when it came to model railroading. And thanks to Frank Miller and his Cascade Valley Railroad, the Ellison legacy lives on. <laughs>